Good afternoon and welcome to the second idea forum in the series, Next Movement, which is hosted by the Presser Foundation and American Composers Forum Philadelphia chapter. My name is Teresa Rogers and I serve as Executive Director of the Presser Foundation. Special thanks to Dustin Hurt, who has provided marketing and technical support to produce the series. This is a webinar version of Zoom, and that just means that participants are not seen, but do have the capability to ask questions and provide comments in the Q&A window. Dustin and I will be monitoring this and we'll do our best to ask questions on each participant's behalf. All five idea forums will be recorded and made available for future viewing. We'll be in communication with links to access the recordings. Each presentation will be 25 minutes long with five minutes for questions and answers. And we hope to wrap up today's session in an hour and a half by 3.30. The impetus for next movement came from so many conversations that I had with executive directors, artistic directors, development directors over the past five months since COVID hit. People shared with me their struggles and their triumphs and I quickly realized that people were craving interaction with their colleagues in the field to uncover best practices, suggestions for technology, ideas for creative program delivery, and thoughts on the future. I must say that when I took the concern to the trustees of the Presser Foundation, there was immediate interest to support our grantee organizations beyond grants, and thus, Next Movement was formulated. 26 organizations answered the call for proposal to present targeting music educators, music presenters, music performers. We selected 10 organizations to present at five idea forums, two for music educators, two for music performers, and one for music presenters. Today's session is the second in the series focused on music educators, and we are so grateful to Play on Philly and Settlement Music School for sharing their creativity and for working alongside us to develop presentations today. So let's get into it. Play on Philly will share the results of their community design sessions, producing two month long programs, Pop Out of the Box and Virtual Summer, and shifting the programming tide from replication to imagination. And now I'm happy to introduce to you all Jessica Swig of Play on Philly. Hi there, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Presser Foundation. I'm really pleased to be speaking with um, my Philadelphia colleagues um, this afternoon and um, to tell you a little, a little bit about what Play on Philly has learned in the last five months. Um, first, I want to say a brief word about what POP is, who POP is as an organization, um, if you're new to us. Um, Play on Philly has been providing equitable, high quality, intensive instrumental music instruction to students who have little or no access to it across Philadelphia for 10 years. We're going into our 10th year, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary. We form strong, lasting school and community partnerships and our programming is tuition free and each student is loaned an instrument and as students grow, their instruments are upgraded. We require a daily commitment from our students and our families. And so pre COVID, our pop students who are kindergarten through 12th graders were practicing their instruments two hours a day, five days a week with us um, after school, many of them for many years. We believe that the group learning or that, that excuse me, we believe that group learning and the orchestra um, ensemble based instruction cultivates technical and musical skills on um, your instrument and has an impact for our students far beyond those musical skills themselves. Additionally, the process of preparing and presenting themselves in a concert is really a central tenet of the transformative experience that uh, our students go through. And as such, in a normal year, students are uh, performing upwards, some various student groups are performing upwards of 30 times a year. Guest artists um, frequent our program regularly and work in really deep ways with pop students. 
the last two years, for instance, we had instrument family festivals uh, to celebrate a section of the orchestra. So last year we had our strings family festival and the Ritz chamber players came and worked for a full day on a Saturday at Curtis, uh, which culminated in a very celebratory string festival concert. Uh, students have worked with the Imani Winds and the Harlem Quartet, um, and they've been conducted by the likes of Simon Rattle and Marin Alsop. Uh, the final thing I'll just say about a little backstory is that, um, you know, we take independent evaluation very seriously. And for the last eight years, we've been able to study the way that intensive instruction on music, in music, um, increases students' executive functioning um, compared to that of their control group peers. It'll get there. There we go. So you can imagine that when the coronavirus hit and lockdown began, Play on Philly, the way we delivered and evaluated our programming and the way that we interacted with our students and families was going to really have to drastically change. So when the in-person program day came to a close on Friday, March 13th, which is a day that I think will live in infamy, we really set to work to create a continuity of instructions for students and families, or so we thought. To keep teaching artists working and contributing to our mission, we asked each one to create three instructional videos a week. Um, and so we have a library of over 100 instructional videos, and these videos ranged from how to play an A major scale on your French horn to how to keep your oboe clean and maintain it. The idea was that students, oops, the idea was that students would maintain the consistent practicing that we had established independent of their in-person studio class or their ensembles, which has been our primary vehicle for delivery. But in the quest for keeping continuity of program and making use of our resources in an effective way, we had really created programming which didn't suit the needs of our students and families because we weren't providing face-to-face -face instruction or creating opportunities for them to play in a group setting together. We also had no way of tracking whether the videos were being used and we couldn't track the impact on student life skill development or their pro-social behaviors or musical progress. And as I mentioned before, evaluation is a really key tenant for us. So as the pandemic continued, it became clear that we thought we had created um, a short, we could create and had created a short-term stopgap, but we realized this was gonna be a longer-term problem. So we moved uh, in a different direction when it became clear that the instructional videos wouldn't be enough to meet the goals that I spoke about earlier. We really started having a conversation about what it meant to reimagine programming as opposed to just replicating. And I envisioned a modified design thinking process that would take our stakeholders through a series of four steps, empathize, define, ideate, and prototype. So in its simplest form, for those who don't know, a design thinking process, it's a very human-centered approach to problem solving. So we modified the various steps uh, to meet the needs of Play on Philly constituents. And it became the foundation for asking ourselves a series of questions about the community we served and the problems we were trying to solve by moving programming online. Over four days and eight hours of listening sessions, we heard from students, we heard from parents, we heard from family members, staff, teachers, all about their experiences in the early days of the stay at home order. So in the empathize stage, which is the first stage of a design thinking process, parents spoke about challenges that they faced trying to keep their children engaged in minds-on activity that was not TV and trying to work from home at the same time. Many of our parents are frontline workers, and so they were also experiencing stresses of finding um, solid childcare. Even if students wanted to be practicing, our youngest students who had started their violins just months before, four or five months before, they didn't know how to tune their instruments. And we hadn't taught their parents how to do that yet, which was a note to us for more parent education. These students also didn't possess the technical knowledge yet to practice independently without a teacher's guidance. 
And many had subpar technology, which made it really difficult to get anything done over Zoom. Our teachers and staff spoke about their eagerness to continue to teach their students, um, but online learning made synchronicity really impossible for a teacher and a student to play together, as I'm sure anybody knows um, if they've been teaching on this platform. So as we began to define and ideate on solutions, which are the next steps of the design thinking process, teachers voiced really creative ways to host a listening salon to ensure students could retain and build their music knowledge base. Uh, teachers spoke of the need to maintain and create new, new ways of building community through studio class uh, or instrument family ties. We really needed to provide music instruction that was as engaging as our in-person model built on meticulously crafted concept-based curriculum, which we had been honing for many years, but utilizing the online tools available to us instead of our in-person model. And in this way, we could really re-envision the pop student experience and continue to teach students to read music and write notation and learn their rhythms and their time signatures and key signatures and practice their ear training. So as we moved forward to the next step in design thinking prototype, we broke into teams of administrators and teachers and we built out age appropriate curriculum. And we just continued to ask ourselves a series of questions. For instance, what problem were we trying to solve? What opportunities did this digital space provide that we really hadn't taken advantage of in person? How could we continue to work toward goals of musical and social emotional growth all in the absence of having uh, in-person interaction with orchestra, with instruments. And very importantly, how could we measure impact? And finally, uh, some questions that we always are asking ourselves at POP really since the beginning, but continue particularly in front of our mind is how do we continue to create connections for our students with really diverse role models? Um, and how do we use this time particularly where we can be connected so easily to so many people from around the world, really? How do we use this time to deepen and expand the role that musicians of color play in the work that we do and the way students see representation in classical music, which is the primary mode that we use to teach our students? So in May, we launched a month of virtual learning, which we affectionately called Pop Out of the Box. We adjusted class, class lengths for the realities of a computer screen, and students participated in core music classes two to three days a week by age group, which was slightly different than our five day a week, two hour a day model um, in person. Elementary age students participated in what we've been calling Sesame Street style classes. They were fast paced. They featured a variety of different activities. So for instance, a teacher uh, made an asynchronous video which explored sound and vibrations and we would watch the video and then shift and students would read a book which corresponded to an activity about exploring vibrations through instrument families and found sounds. Middle and high school students took a deep dive into composition as a vehicle for learning music theory concepts and they would use breakout rooms to do smaller collaborations and create little pieces. So Dustin, I'm gonna ask you to queue up um, the Zakaya and Arion video right now. This is a clip um, of a Mr. Dave, who's usually one of our teaching artists, uh, percussion teaching artists, but he is going to um, explain, or, or he is going to show you um, a, a little clip of this composition class with two of our students. But Zakaya, I wanna see you say just a couple of things about the clarinet line, maybe what you like about it or what you were thinking when you wanted to add part of it. So go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, when I was adding like the notes for the um clarinet part, I guess I wanted it to sound like happy and like joyful, I guess. Right, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, definitely some of the kind of quicker rhythms help that, like a little groovy. Yeah, and do you think you could play this on clarinet? Um, probably. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ariane, you wrote that viola line yourself. Um, say, why did, what did you, what were you thinking when you wrote it? Um, I kind of just thought, you know, I'm gonna try to not 
well, kind of like intertwine the notes so that it's not like a bunch of like notes clashing together. Sorry if you can hear my brother in the back. But, um, <laughs> it's okay. So it's not like a bunch of notes clashing together. So when there were quarter notes, I did the eighth notes. And then when there were like some faster rhythm, that's where I put the slower notes. And then when Zakaya kind of, um, um, when the clarinet had the, um, tied notes that's when i put the 16th notes so it could like switch up a little bit so like it's it was like inconsistent but on purpose yeah that that's awesome that those are very good composing instincts like you're trying to balance out what the clarinet what was happening in the clarinet line yeah i didn't um, want it to be too much yeah i really like that i think it came out really nicely the viola line Great, thank you, Justin. Yeah, so you can really hear in um, in Ariane's explanation that she's making pretty conscious choices about her composition, um, and she doesn't even really know it yet, but she's really talking about musical texture. Oh. Um, students were also invited to participate in workshops. Um, there was a listening salon where students um, heard what were in their favorite teacher's ear and um, talked about music analysis in a very kid-friendly way. There were instrument hangouts uh, where students got to connect with students who played the same instrument as them, and if they had been practicing at home, they would play for each other in informal recitals. And to ensure that we could accurately measure our impact and continue to iterate for our future virtual sessions, we engaged uh, Wolf Brown Consulting Firm to do some independent assessment of the work. So students and parents were asked to respond to engagement and satisfaction surveys several times throughout the month um, to get a better sense of what Play on Philly was actually providing. The graph that you see here analyzes the results of the question that was given to caregiver, caregivers and students. And the question that this chart is showing is um, answering, how much did your child or you, your, the student, learn at Play on Philly? So a plurality of the 74 caregiver respondents, um, which is represented in the red bar, and the 61 student respondents represented by the blue bar show that most people through uh, most people thought, excuse me, that their child or themselves learned a lot or a great deal, which were the two highest ratings during pop out of the box. So in true design thinking fashion, we took some time between May pop out of the box and then July virtual summer programming to notice and reflect with teachers and program staff and with the help of the engagement surveys, as well as some student theory assessments that we did collect, um, we made tweaks to our program design. We realized that much like our students are used to concert goals, and a lot of them, you heard 30 concerts-ish throughout the year, uh, project-based learning was really gonna need to become um, a central tenant that grounded the classes. And it was gonna give students a chance to think about more goal orientation and use higher order thinking skills. Much like in person, collaboration was gonna become essential for what would make students successful. And as we do during a normal in-person summer camp year, um, where we have six weeks of eight hour a day programming and it's just such a blast, we wanted to incorporate interdisciplinary options for students who wanted to express themselves creativity through art or through writing. And the last part of it is that we, we decided on the themes um, for virtual summer of community and voice as ones that would really bind the programming together and link our community together, particularly in the wake of the social unrest in our country and the killing of George Floyd. So July came around and we welcomed 135 students from Philadelphia as far as Dallas and Atlanta and Durham and Cincinnati and our uh, Play on Philly music centers in Philadelphia and our broader Philadelphia community and rooted in the concepts and the contents and the understandings that the Play on Philly curriculum provided as sort of the base, we tested our new prototype in, in a few different ways. Um, our younger students created their very own storybook using a really fantastic online platform called Book Creator. And students worked as a class to draw pictures and they made I am here statements, which really told the story of their voice. 
Each Friday in July, the young students joined a jam session with pop teaching artists to learn about genre, and we broke it down into lullaby, ceremony, and dance music, and musical form. They learned how to compose in ABA and in rondo form. These jam sessions became the soundtrack for the book that they had written. For the middle and high school students, they worked with composer and former producer member of Public Enemy, Kerwin Young, to grapple, to grapple excuse me, with how music can be their voice. Students learned about motivic development and they presented their own material to Kerwin in the form of a visual image or a little written statement or a piece of musical writing, which Kerwin then took and threaded together into an original piece. And students and teaching artists created a socially distant recording of the final piece. The title was ominously called Nature's Karmic Vengeance. All students had the opportunity to work with Philadelphia-based spoken word artist Charlotte Blake Alston to write poems that told the story of their community and their identity. Students also created visual art response pieces to the work of Black musicians Mary Lou Williams and Brian Farrow, and some of our most advanced string players learned to record like a studio musician, where they listened to a click track, and they played the work of another Black living composer, the fantastic Carlos Simon. Dustin, would you cue that second video? Awesome, awesome, awesome. That was great, guys. That was great. Wow. It was better than I expected it to be. That was, that was pretty good. <laughs> wow. Why? Why do you, why? Tell me why. Why did you expect it? Is it, it sounded great. Thanks. Yeah, because it was like, um, like putting all the videos together, I was like, oh, I don't want it to sound like jumbled mm -hmm. or like overlap, because you no, know, it's not <laughs> it's like being in person. So I didn't want it to be like overpowering each other, and then, like we can't like um, really um, bring the dynamics in fully because we're not all together, and then we don't want to be too quiet to the point where you can't hear, but then we don't want to be too loud to the point where you can't hear anybody else. So yeah, and excuse my brother in the background if you can hear him. I'm so sorry about that, but yeah. Yeah. It's a hard thing. What about you, Camille? You feel the same way? I feel the exact same way. I, when I was playing it by myself, I was I really felt the need to just grab everybody that was in the quintet and just go, you know what, we're doing this coronavirus to know we need to do this together so we can, you know, sound a little bit more together. I should have probably set this up a little bit, but what you just saw was um, a group of a subset of our little uh, student group that played this Carlos Simon piece, um, speaking with Carlos Simon the day before this premiered um, to our full community. Um, and they got to see themselves playing for the first time. They got to talk with Carlos about it. And um, it's funny that Arion was in the video I, I showed a little earlier, but um, the the girls were just they were so excited and the way that they talked about their music with Carlos um, was pretty powerful I think not only as just an observer but um, to our students and to Carlos himself 
Uh, and then you saw uh, the actual uh, a piece of the little performance that we did um, as part of the summer showcase uh, with these young musicians, as well as some pop alums who came and helped us put everything together. So this summer showcase, which this was a part of, was presented last Friday, and it really became a true source of pride um, for the entire Play on Philly community um, from Philadelphia um, to really all over the United States for people who got to watch um, because everything that was displayed was virtually, no pun intended, created by the students. As we look toward the fall, which we have decided uh, to begin completely online, we continue to ask ourselves questions about how our programmatic and our operational, our development choices can engage students and spark learning and make an impact in the way that we set out to. We continue to push ourselves to think about the choices we make and who represents the world of music and also what they look like. The collaborations that we have had excuse me, that we have had have inspired future planning um, for diversifying the repertoire that students play regularly, not just as like a one-off event for our Play on Philly students. Our staff is becoming more agile and flexible as constant change becomes just a reliable part of our life right now. And we are committed as ever to assessment and evaluation and we'll continue to work with Wolf Brown to collect data that measures the effectiveness of our virtual programming. This will include more musical assessment as well. Um, we're thinking about how we can build a comprehensive assessment of our students' um, musical growth in the first session of um, the year, as well as some qualitative measures like the one you saw. And just as we welcomed students nationally for the summer, summer, we're really hoping to continue to open our proverbial Zoom room doors to students across the country and city to continue to build a musical community. Thank you so much for um, being here. Thanks so much. Um, we do have some time for questions. If anyone wants to add them uh, to the Q&A window, I have a couple um, here already. Uh, one I just want to uh, start with, what obstacles did you face in terms of uh, getting the students uh, online? And uh, were there any um, tips or specific ways you uh, addressed uh, getting students online? This is a great question because normally in person, um, our students come down the stairs at the end of the school day and they're right there in our auditorium or in our classrooms. Um, and online, it has been um, a challenge. You know, we always have that core group of students that they're there every single time. Their, reg their registration comes in first. But we do a pretty uh, good job of doing an aggressive outreach campaign. Um, we, you know, have a very uh, pretty uh, aggressive schedule. I don't know a better word, but an aggressive schedule um, for texting and calling our students to check in. Um, we did that a lot at the beginning, particularly just because we wanted to make sure that everybody was okay. Um, and so we were making phone calls, sending texts, uh, emailing pretty regularly. And then, excuse me, um, in the summer, we uh, piloted a online platform for communicating directly with the students called Edmodo. Uh, and we're still working out the kinks for that, but it particularly works with the older ones to get them uh, interacting with their teacher and a little bit more independently submitting their work without having to go through their parents' email or getting a text. Cool, um, thanks so much. Uh, one other question that I had was um, sort of a follow-up to that. Uh, were there uh, specific softwares uh, or websites that you found useful? I saw there was one that looked like you were using for composition and arrangements. Are there some uh, that maybe you can rattle off and then we can put in the sort of show notes later? Sure. Uh, well, we've been using a lot of note flight for our older students. It's like a very elementary version of um, Finale or Sibelius if you're familiar with compositional software. Uh, we've also used, and I'm going to butcher the name, but it has something to do with pizza and rhythm, pizza rhythm or something, and it's a great visual for showing rhythmic divisions and subdivisions. We've been using that a lot, and Book Creator has just been fantastic for the young ones. Um, thank you. Uh, somebody asked a sort of follow-up question. Um, did you find there were 
uh, challenges associated with specifically with like, I guess the hardware for students to get online? Either it looked like some kids were maybe on laptops or phones. Was that something uh, you were able to address? Yes, yeah, so pretty early on, we did a technology survey um, and got a fair, a fair, fairly good response from our entire um, uh, student population. Uh, because of the great schools that we work with, um, a number of the schools were passing out Chromebooks to their to their students. So um, most students had laptops, although some were using um, iPads or phones. And we tried as much as possible in advance to come up with strategies for students who could only use those devices. Um, and then, yeah, we were just constantly trying to troubleshoot. We were pretty fortunate that we could have a teacher and an, administ and an administrator, excuse me, in each class. And if a student was just having trouble getting to something, um, we'd just put that student in a room with the administrator and they'd sort of troubleshoot with them. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I think at this point, we're gonna say thank you to Jess and Play on Philly, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Teresa, uh, who will introduce our next uh, speaker. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Jessica. Um, so while Jessica shared um, Play on Philly's design thinking framework used to reimagine, Settlement Music School is going to take us through their process of planning, selecting a delivery platform, training faculty, and providing technical support to both teachers and students. They're going to discuss silver linings of this worldwide shift in music education delivery. Um, and here to present on behalf of Settlement Music School is Terrell Davis, Helen Eaton, and Karen Orenstein. Great. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm just gonna wait one moment till our presentation is up on the screen. One second, thanks. Great. So thank you very much. If you would move to the next slide. So joining me today is Terrell Davis, the Director of Arts Integrated Head Start Preschool Program, Kaleidoscope, and Karen Orenstein, our Director of Education. It's really an honor to be selected by the Presser Foundation to speak with peers about how to lead in these unprecedented times. Congratulations to Jessica and Pop for their work and the creativity that they have brought to their program development. Today, I will share how we approach the pandemic, how we continue to learn and change, and how partnering was critical to making informed and sensitive decisions. We'll talk about how this was carried out through all the different programs that the school runs, um, which you will also hear a lot of details on this from Karen and Terrell. Our process was informed by our longtime approach to innovation, which can be put into play in one way or another by organizations or individuals at any budget or staff size. Next slide. Here are some basic facts about settlement in case you're not familiar with our institution. We're one of the largest community schools of the arts in the US. We give $2.6 million in financial aid each year to 60% of our students. Financial aid is unlimited. We have no cap on aid. Our budget is 60% earned revenue and 40% contributed revenue. We have the highest level of accreditation for community schools of the arts and our pre-K program. And we're a member of the National Guild for Community Arts Education. Next slide. At Settlement, we have 200 plus faculty members, 40 of whom have taught at the, year, at the school 25 years or longer. We have a branch system throughout the Philadelphia region and in a typical year, 50 plus community partnerships happen on a weekly basis. 
These partnerships range from work in the public schools to city recreation centers, Ronald McDonald houses, and social service agencies. Every week, during a non-pandemic year, we provide over 10,000 weekly services in pre-K, early childhood classes, creative arts therapy, private lessons, chamber and jazz ensembles, rock bands, dance, and we have a really robust senior program. So our number one priority has been our people and our focus on access and equity. Here are a few of the photos in action. Several weeks prior to our building's closing, we had already started planning for moving all of our programming online. We mobilized our entire branch staff and created a plan for distance learning. We chose Skype for Business as our platform because we felt it was secure and we were very familiar with it. We developed a tech team of 20 people at Settlement who were all trained in this one platform in a matter of days. And it helped enormously as questions arose that we only had to navigate one platform. Since then, we branched out a bit, but it was a really great start. We had created a faculty user manual and a student user manual for Skype for Business about a week before we closed for in-person instruction. And we immediately started writing translations for the student manual that is now in six different languages accessible on our website. We closed our doors to in-person teaching on March 12th, and as Jessica was saying earlier, on that infamous day of March 13th, we started distance learning. We had faculty members who had never even used a computer or used the internet. We had computers safely delivered to their homes and coached them daily until they got the hang of it. We got up online 170 teachers in a matter of days, which was almost every single teacher in our core program. We also coordinated with the school district to make sure that we did everything we could to support our partnerships with the district. We kept our families engaged, creating a sense of normalcy in their lives and our faculty employed. Next slide. We established from the outset a few basic tenets that have helped us enormously. Communicate and communicate often. We've let our families know that we are here for them We've let our teachers know that we are here for them. We have sent our message about the value of arts education to our constituency and beyond. And we have asked for assistance and employed assistance to help us reach new audiences. One way that we decided from the outset to reach new audiences was to offer free programming through Facebook Live. And you'll hear more about this momentarily. So what does this look like for programming? I will turn it over to Karen Weinstein. Next slide, please. Thank you, Helen. I, I agree with Jessica and Helen. I think March 13th will be engraved in all of our memories forever. But Settlement has been online since March 13th, and we've been continually working since that date to enhance our online teaching practices. We are doing all that we can to remove the barriers for families to engage in distance learning. We have offered additional financial aid to any family that needs it, including adults. And we've also launched asynchronous teaching, which enabled families who were not able to have a lesson on a specific day or time, maybe they just had one device, any kind of instance that they could not guarantee that day and time to still continue their studies with their teachers. Students, if you're not familiar with asynchronous, students send videos to their teachers on their own time. Teachers respond with a telephone call, email, video of themselves. We've also been able to offer additional times for lessons now, which are now even occurring earlier and even later in the evening based on the teacher and the student schedules. We partnered with Jacobs Music, who donated 30 keyboards to us. Soon as they heard that some of our students had been displaced and not able to access their instruments, they immediately stepped up and were able to provide us with these 30 keyboards, which we were then able to pass out to our students so that they could continue their studies. Next slide. We are getting feedback every day from our teachers and our students and using it to continually improve. There are benefits to distance learning. Students are able to attend lessons even when they may not have transportation, a family member is sick or they're out of town. But what we know is that it contains continual oversight to make sure that the teachers have all that they need to be able to provide the level of expertise that we know that happens in person on this virtual platforms. Our program staff is always working with our faculty to troubleshoot lessons and classes. 
we know that each faculty member teaches differently. So this is an ongoing and ever evolving process. We also expanded our Settlement 101 introductory videos to make it a live experience on Facebook on a weekly basis. They were intended to provide online content that can be a resource for our families and additional opportunities for our faculty. We have partnered with other experts in the field to create virtual learning tools for students. On the slide, you'll see music production with smartphones, which was actually a program that we partnered with Drexel University's Young Dragons program and discussed a program called Band Lab for their Young Dragons. Next slide. Communicating with partners has been essential to getting us through and finding opportunities to thrive. What we know is that settlement cannot do this alone. We are only as good as our partners. And right now, the collaboration, learning, and sharing of resource is vital to moving community arts as a whole forward. As a member of the National Guild for Community Arts Education, we are part of a collective that is figuring it out together. We do Zoom calls every few weeks with peer institutions across the country, peers by size and scope of programs, and we talk about our needs and our aspirations. We are all trying not to reinvent the wheel in this new environment and work together. We exchange best practices, documents we've developed, any kind of concepts, ideas that we can all talk together through. We are all so invested in the community music that we speak the same language. So one bit of advice I would say is find your allies and your colleagues that can support you in these same ways. Next slide. There's shared learning online from resources that NAFME and PMEA, as well as different social media groups, such as Facebook groups called Music Educators Creating Online Listening and Online Music Teachers. We are always looking at these, reading these. We've found so many resources through these different webinars and through some of these Facebook online groups. One of the topics that we are always discussing are the various online tools. We have tools that some teachers love, others don't. There's a lot of emotion around various tools. People have different opinions. Some work for some, some don't work for others. Some faculty can use them, others don't. We know that there's not a magic mirror, so we are advising them on what makes sense for them and what they need at that moment for their groups. Next slide. For family resources and faculty opportunities, we provide music and movement classes for young children in our Facebook Kids Live series on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we recently won the Best of Philly recognition for these classes. We have taken advantage of this opportunity to offer a wide range of diverse classes from songwriting, music production, improvisation, creativity and self-care, looping, the list goes on and on. Um, we have been able to ex expand our geographical representation for new students up to six states and as far away as Idaho right now. And all that to say, what is next? We know that virtual learning is here to stay. There's always gonna be interruptions and changes to learning and closures, shifts in enrollment, different expectations of how we learn, but our faculty are pivoting, creating new ways of delivery, new opportunities for collaboration, and they're even deepening their connections with their students and families. What we know is that this can, excuse me, consistently deliver high levels of education no matter what platform, we can only ramp up our technology. I'm now gonna turn it over to Terrell. Terrell has been with Settlement as a director of Kaleidoscope for 12 years, and she has helped take our preschool program to a nationally recognized preschool, Arts Integrated, and Terrell? Hello, thank you, Karen. Um, thank you for your time today and listening. I'm gonna talk about Kaleidoscope, which is Arts Integrated, in early childhood and I'm going to start off by just giving you some attributes about the program and what makes us so successful. Um, there's been tremendous interest in arts integration over the years, so much so that it's led us to create mentorships and workshops for other organizations. And in spring 2018, I had the privilege to speak to a room full of arts educators. I'm typically speaking to early childhood practitioners and educators, um, but this time I was able to speak to art teachers in regards to art integration. And it was a great experience. Um, they spent the day um, moving through the arts classes as if they were the students to get a better idea of you know, how the curriculum actually works. Um, this was in collaboration with the Please Touch Museum. And they provided more of an insight to what a visual arts studio would look like within their museum. They created that to engage parents and teachers a little more while they were visiting the museum. 
we sent out invitations across the city and there were over 25 participants um, in attendance. And um, it was a great, they had fun, they had a lot of questions, they played, they danced, and but they had some questions and they had some interest and pretty much a lot of them were interested in, you know, just arts integration, you know, what it's about, what it looks like for us. Um, some of them were interested in getting some ideas for their youngest participants in their organization. And some were interested in just embarking on early childhood and pre-K for the first time. So I'll get started telling you a little bit about Kaleidoscope in case you have some of those same interests. Kaleidoscope began in 1990 as a preschool program to teach school readiness uh, concepts to uh, preschool age children, um, pretty much children coming in at a disadvantage. Uh, the classes are 40 minutes long. Uh, we run Monday through Friday, and it's a 10-month program, September to June. Um, right now, 90% of our families are federally funded through Head Start, and 10% pay a private tuition. Um, Kaleidoscope has received the most prestigious accreditations in the field of early childhood, um, have gotten awards and accolades um, from even the White House. So if you could, let's go to the next slide. I would like to take a minute to show you just a quick video of, you know, what it looks like to weave a school readiness concept like patterns through the art studios. Typically, these classes are 40 minutes long. But for the sake of this, it's just going to be a snapshot, two minutes of what it looks like to integrate patterns. Today we're going to be doing a book about patterns and then we're going to make some patterns. This is called my first book of patterns and you can see one pattern on the front. Does anybody know what it's called? We'll find out in the book. This is a line. A lot of lines makes <gasps> stripes. Do you see any stripes in your room? Now to make a pattern, we could put them in line. So we put a red one and then a blue one. And then a red one and then a blue one. And then a red one and a blue one. So if you see the red and blue, look, it's red and blue. Look, it's red and blue. So it does the same thing over and over. What do I do with my hands? So every time you go over the red, you're going to clap. Ready? Clap. Blue. Clap. Blue. Clap. Blue. So friends, we are going to make a pattern with pats and claps. A pattern is something that repeats over and over and over again. And our pattern will be pat, pat, clap, clap with the same song, just like this. Let's sing hello, hello. Let's sing hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. Let's sing hello. So the video was a little jumbled, but for the parents, it's only jumbled because it's, it was put inside the PowerPoint, but for the parents, um, it's not that way. It's, it's seamless. Um, but as you've seen, there were four classes and there was an early childhood teacher, which was Scott, who was at the table. And then there were the artist teachers that you've seen as well. That's the collaboration that is essential for us to be able to provide this um, art integration in the way that we do for our children. The teachers partner and do practically everything together. Um, they do parent-teacher conferences together. They plan lessons together. And that's why we're able to provide these quality lessons year in and year out. Um, they also work on goals and accomplishments together for any you know, particular child. Um, and that's why the program is so amazing because of this partnership. Um, the teachers work very well together and, and that's essential. Theoretic, theoretically, excuse me, the teachers, one child has five teachers that teach them, observe them, assess them, and pretty much are, you know, taking care of them and nurturing them, five teachers for one child. Um, so that's amazing. Um, 
if you could slide to the next slide, please. The teachers were using a tool called Camp, um, I'm sorry, Classroom Dojo immediately when we were shot out of our classrooms on March 13th. Um, it's something that they were using throughout the year uh, to connect with the parents through, you know, dialogue throughout the day, uploading videos and pictures in real time throughout the day, working on goals and accomplishments as well throughout the day. And it, it was just a good tool to keep parents engaged and informed. Um, but when COVID hit, you know, the teachers had to kind of pull together and send their lessons in that way to the parents. And the artist teachers started sending videos of the arts classes and all of them were still uh, you know, collaborating with the same concept, that it was all being sent to the parents virtually. So that led me to believe that what the teachers were so capable of doing it that way, to start thinking of an arts uh, virtual curriculum. And that led me to think of something called Campus. So that the tool that, the sample that you've seen today of our videos is what um, our curriculum would look like in a tool called Canvas. And what Canvas could, would allow us to do would be to provide many of our components um, of our program virtually. Um, parent-teacher uh, conferences, assessments and screens can still be done. We can still address peer <clears throat> relations and address social awareness by providing activities for peers in a variety of ways. And the arts integration, we can put the arts there still surrounding around the same concept that the early childhood teacher introduced and it all be in one place. Um, so that's something that we were able to think of. And if anyone's interested in that, I could be a resource uh, to talk more about that at some point. So I would just like to sum up by saying that uh, the Kaleidoscope program is a wonderful program. I was actually a classroom teacher there back in the 90s. I have a long relationship with this program. Um, just for the sake of time, to say one thing that I love about the program would be that, you know, to sum it up in one word would be opportunity. This program provides opportunities. It's a gift for parents and teachers, and most importantly, our children, that they take with them uh, for life. You know, they get these these skills and, and this wonderful um, relationships with with other teachers and children, and these opportunities, you know, sticks with them and it, and they take it outside of our walls. So, thank you for your time today, and I would just like to give it back to Helen. I get started? Okay, so how do these different programming initiatives fit into a bigger strategic vision for settlement? One way to think about the old versus the new is a paradigm that we adopted out of work we did with the consulting firm Inasight. Inasight is a global innovation firm that we've worked with during multiple periods since 2012. It's called the 50-30-20 model. It's an excellent framework that Innocite gave us for understanding where innovation should fit within our school. 50% of your time should be spent on refining your core business. 30% of your time should be spent on developing extensions of your core business, areas that you believe you could be good at because they're similar to the tried and true. But we know that not all of our efforts should be spent on innovating, even now. 20% is about the right percentage that reflects this calculated risk taking. And of course, you know that you don't need an innovation firm to tell you how to do it. We're all artists and a very creative group of people at that. Thinking about innovation just needs to become an everyday habit in your organization. Next slide, please. Most recently, just this past May, Settlement had the opportunity to work with two InnoSight consultants. They offered their services pro bono on helping us develop our programming for our virtual branch. They're helping us stay customer focused in our program development and helping us ask the critical questions about what our prospective students want and need from a 21st century community music school. We've had such a good experience with them over the past years that Scott Anthony, one of the lead partners of Innocite, has written about settlement as a case study in his upcoming book to be released in November by Harvard Business Review Press. We're one of eight case studies that also includes Microsoft, Procter & Gamble, UNICEF, and the Salvation Army. 
Scott wrote an introductory article to this book in Harvard Business Review Press's December 2019 edition that you should definitely check out. It's really a terrific article. Next slide. So this is one snapshot of the work that we've been doing. We're looking at the intersection of the jobs to be done by the consumer, what do consumers really need, and are we the ones to bring this into fruition? They gave us 18 different scenarios to consider based on the work of our staff. We're in the process of identifying audiences and programs and taking a deep dive into our work and into conducting interviews with a number of our customers to understand better what needs are being met by engaging with settlement. And this process has been incredibly interesting. Next slide. So I just wanna leave you with a few final thoughts that I know all of you are already doing. Listen to your constituencies. Everyone has good ideas. Just decide what works for you and works now. Things will change. Be comfortable with the uncomfortable and engage your colleagues. You really are not alone in this process. And a final slide. And I'd like to leave you with one quote that we are all living right now where arts organizations are uniquely qualified to respond in this way because creativity and responsiveness is embedded in all of the work we do. Lots of companies don't succeed over time. What do they do fundamentally that can take things in the wrong direction? They usually miss the future. Thank you very much for having us today and we're happy to answer any questions. One second. Uh, so we have a question that came across the chat and I, I think it refers specific to a, a slide that I saw earlier. Um, there is a breakdown uh, of free programming versus paid programming. And I wonder if maybe someone can talk about uh, which programs are, are free, which programs are paid and, and how you're sort of managing paid programs that are virtual uh, in a general sense. Sure. So um, at Settlement, I mean, we have so many different programs that it depends um, on uh, the specifics of the program. So our program in partnership with the public schools through Music Education Pathways is a free program to the students. That's our intensive after school music instruction. Um, Kaleidoscope, our Head Start students, that's an entirely free program through the Head Start um, program. Um, our lessons, our ensembles that we give, um, those are primarily tuition paying, but what's so important to know is that it's on a sliding scale. And that especially when COVID hit, we got on the phone with our families um, and made sure that there were no economic barriers to a student participating in our programs. And we worked enormously hard on that. And then the Facebook Live series, that was really the work of Karen Ornstein and our communications department was um, something that we actually decided before we even closed. We were sitting around the branch directors one night at what we call our scholarship auditions, and it was about, I think, two weeks out from closing when we started to think about what we, what we could give back in the community, and we all felt that it was incredibly important to really um, offer these uh, programs to families um, free through Facebook. And so we've had a lot of success with that as well and it's i know uh karen and our communications department and our faculty have found it a really interesting process thank you um i'm curious if maybe uh we, you can also talk a little bit about things you have found uh that are different um for each age group maybe this is uh something that you know a question that refers to um how much screen time different age groups can can kind of uh, last through different types of activities? Are there certain uh, ways in like kind of uh, ways in which the age group breaks down? Um, and have you also similarly done any of this sort of programming with adults in mind? Sure, you know what, I'll start with the adults and then I'm gonna turn it over to Karen to talk about the kids and also to Terrell because they're spending a lot of time thinking about our different age groups with our children. We have a really robust senior program called Adult Chamber Players where um, adults get together um, at three of our branches on a weekly basis to play chamber music. And we have 
well over 100 people involved in this program. And I have to say that this has been heartbreaking for them. Um, this is a huge moment of social connection for them. Um, they change the groups up every week. So it's just kind of endlessly interesting, the music that they play and the people that they meet. So what we did when we knew that we wouldn't be able to continue this program in person is we started a series um, especially designed for adult chamber players from a lecture series to even a movement series by one of our really fabulous dance teachers. Um, and so we've had a lot of success with that. And we've also even done kind of Zoom uh, virtual cocktail hours and lunches so that they could feel connected because so many of them are over the age of 65, 70, and they do feel very isolated. So we're paying very close attention to that. And I'll turn it over to Karen and Terrell to talk about our kids. I'll just talk briefly, Karen. Um, so I think that one of the things that makes this work is that our branch staff has really good relationships with all our families. So when a family or a child is getting the family's concerned about screen time, they're having any sort of issue getting online, anything like that, um, we are able to offer a variety of options. So that could be that asynchronous option where the teacher has recorded a short video of what they want the kid to do. And then during their screen time, they watch this little video and then they're able to kind of work it on the family's schedule. We know that a lot of families kind of had to pivot multiple times. And so by doing that asynchronous option, by having the lessons at different times, we were offering lessons on Sundays in the evenings, all different points to be adaptable for the families that we were able to really, really reach a lot of the families through those kind of different means. Terrell, do you wanna? Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, for, for me, our children are younger. They're preschool, pre-K, three, four, and five. Um, and, you know, our partnership with the district, there are some stipulations, you know, our children shouldn't have more than 90 minutes live a day. Um, but, you know, instantly going out using Dojo, um, it, we were already using that. So the parents were already engaged with, with most of their teachers and, and the program. So it was, it's an everyday thing. So we knew who had in internet, who had access, um, who was able to, you know, participate with us when we left out. So we had a good idea. Um, and we're not, like I said, the artist classes, what I mentioned in Canvas, that there are 40 minutes, um, that's broken, that 40 minutes is broken down. Like typically, really, they give an introduction to the concept, they read a book, an activity, and a closing. Um, so, and then, and then it's broken up, the, the early childhood teachers separate from the artist classes. And it's in, I uh, neglected to mention that Canvas will also add an asynchronous and synchronous option as well. So they can go back and look at those videos at, you know, when they can, because we took a lot of, into consideration about virtual learning from our parents as well. So I hope that was helpful. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm also, uh, we're going to bring Jess back into the conversation from POP. Um, and <laughs> I'm going to relay a question here that came through the chat from uh, Bill Rhodes. Hi, Bill. Um, I'll just read it. Uh, given the nature of online platforms, um, I know many organizations are thinking about expanding uh, their services nationally or even internationally. Uh, what are the, so, um, some of the challenges for POP or uh, Settlement as you contemplate um, offering programs uh, potentially to exponential number of students? Sure. Hi, Bill. Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, so for Play on Philly, we really see this as a connectivity point. Um, our students, uh, our, our programming is based off of, um, you know, an international model, a Venezuelan youth orchestra model. And there are inspired organizations like Play on Philly all over the country. And we see this as um, another opportunity to connect all of those students where maybe typically they would only have, um, you know, one connection point a year, or maybe they wouldn't even know that there were other students in other parts of the country or the world that were learning in this very intensive way. Um, so we're really using this as um, an opportunity to make this community just a little bit bigger to see beyond just ourselves and our small community and, and think about what community is. Um, as far as the number of students in a class, we're also really turning that on its head. Um, you know, in a typical 
in a, a studio class in person, we'd have between eight and 10 students learning an instrument every single day with their teacher. Uh, but what are the implications for a Zoom room? Um, how does a breakout room work? What is every inch of every part of Zoom or any platform that we can use to dive in and um, add more students to our classes, add more students to um, the reach of Play on Philly? So it's settlement. Um... About six weeks before we closed for in-person instruction, we had the official launch of a partnership with Hearing First, which is a national organization who works with children with hearing impairments. And we offered a webinar that we actually spent quite a long time preparing for. So I have to say we learned a lot about doing this type of learning before um, we closed for in-person instruction. And that was an incredible experience because we were able to use their international platform um, with this webinar with one of our leading um, early childhood music teachers, Martha Glaze Zook, and we had people joined from about 11 different countries, Australia, Peru, Italy, France. It was really an incredible moment. Um, and one of the things we learned from that, especially in having an international platform, um, is having a partner, right? Just as Jess was sharing about El Sistema, um, we also feel that those platforms are, those relationships to create the international platforms are really essential. Um, and I would also just say that we have had a lot of um, uh, good experiences with our virtual branch since we launched it. We did do a significant investment in marketing very uh, soon after March 13th. So we knew that we wanted to get the word out that this was possible, especially when we saw how well our teachers were taking to it. Um, so there has been a significant investment or as significant as a nonprofit can make at this time, realistically. Um, but that has also helped us a great deal through social media and other marketing efforts. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I think we'll do one final question here uh, that we got in a couple different places in a couple different ways. So I'll try to summarize them, but um, it, it's maybe a kind of a logistics question, um, but how do how have the different organizations handled where, where it's necessary passing out instruments to students? I think there's both a practical question of, of um, how do you sort of make sure you get them back and the obligation for the family but also uh, Teresa from Presser actually mentioned that she's been getting inquiries um, for, from other organizations about accessing or purchasing instruments for students. Um, so I'm curious how settlement and play on Philly are, are addressing access to instruments. Jess, do you wanna start? Sure, um, good question. This is part of our model. Uh, every student who is a play on Philly student um, goes through a pretty, um, intensive process at the beginning of a year to orient the family and um, to really understand what it is that the experience that they're about to go on um, through through a long period of time years really part of that is signing an instrument contract um, and understanding that your instrument is something that you know for the little ones you treat like a little baby doll um, it's really precious to you so um, this is not anything new we have students who have harps in their home we have students who have clarinets and flutes and oboes and violins and um, we've uh, really honored the same commitment that they had before which is they sign an instrument contract they understand the value of that instrument and um, that we need it back at a certain point that if something happens to it um, the family uh, should make a small contribution to helping get it repaired. So we also have quite a number of instruments um, out on loan from settlement. In this time specifically, um, I'll just share about the distribution of the keyboards. Actually, I'm gonna turn it over to Karen and then I'll take it back from Karen to share one other idea. So the distribution of keyboards um, through the wonderful generosity of Jacob's Music was very helpful. Do you wanna share how that worked, Karen? Sure, so we are, again, back to that relationship that our students have with their branches. The branches were, through these conversations, able to identify the students that had this need. And so once we received these amazing keyboards, we passed them out to the branches and the branches doing a complete social distancing, we're able to have the families come pick up the instruments um, and from the branches. If they were not able to come pick up the branch or come to the branch, we were able to just 
drop off the keyboards, but the idea was that it was still socially distanced, but we were able to get them their instruments that they needed during this time. Here's one thing that I learned um, that I was just on a phone call with the director of our music education pathways program this morning as we launch into a new school year in partnership with the district. Um, and we are planning on starting beginners in the program and without being able to do kind of the famous petting zoo where the kids come in and they try out the trumpet and the trombone and the flute and all these instruments. Um, and that's not really possible in a safe way. It seems that there's a kit that you can purchase where um, it can give you everything that you need to try out all the various woodwind and brass instruments that can be sent to somebody's home um, safely so that then they can have a live lesson with the teacher and try it out and then you can help choose what the right instrument is for the kid. So just found out about that one and that just came out in May. So we're excited to, to see how that might work because obviously it's easy with violin. You just kind of measure the length of the child's arm and, and things like that. It's a little bit harder with the woodwinds and brass instruments. So stay tuned. We will probably have more information about this um, in a month or so. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, I wanna thank all of the panelists uh, that presented today uh, on behalf of um, ACF Philly and the Presser Foundation. Uh, and thanks to all the uh, uh, attendees uh, watching and your attention. Uh, this video will uh, be available uh, afterwards. It's uh, currently viewable on uh, our Facebook page and we'll uh, have other places to, to view it. Um, so if there's specific, uh, you know, websites or resources that you can look back there. Um, and again, thank you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Teresa. Thanks so much. Yep, just to echo um, Dustin, thank you um, to our presenters and our participants for joining us today. Um, I thought I would take this opportunity to share uh, with the prospective grantee organizations of the Presser Foundation that we have made a couple of changes to our special project grant making area. First and foremost, we moved up the due date um, for those applications from October 15th to, to rather September 15th. This move allows us to pay out grant funds two months ahead of schedule, putting much needed funds in the hands of music organizations as they continue on with their music programming. We've also added criteria for grant consideration, stating that we're open to receiving creative proposals supporting music programming efforts which can be realized during this fiscal year. So it's our hope with Next Movement that music organizations across the city will be inspired and perhaps learn a few things and know that the grant funds are available through special projects that can be applied towards your immediate and creative programming. Um, so as Dustin had said, a special thank you to Jessica from Play on Philly, Terrell, Helen, and Karen from Settlement Music School. Also a big thanks to our co-presenter, American Composers Forum Philadelphia chapter, and Dustin more specifically. We'll be making this recording available as Dustin shared via Facebook live stream. And finally, please consider joining us for the next Next Movement. Um, which will be taking place tomorrow, August 14th at 10 a.m., where we're going to hear from Mendelssohn Chorus of Philadelphia and Opera Delaware. So um, that closes us out for today. Thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>